for the first three tours that I went on to New Japan, they gave us suitcases. This one actually still has the bag tags, my name, and everything filled full of New Japan goodies uh, from Japanese, different Japanese memorabilia stuff. And uh, they're Samsonite suitcases. And they gave these away for um, probably a year or two. And um, so during that year, I uh, received three of these, <laughs> one on every tour, and they were the same color. So uh, uh, some of the guys made some wise cracks, and they wound up, uh, you know how the guys are, they ruin everything. Yeah. Uh, not everybody, but some of them. And so they stopped giving these tremendous suitcases um, uh, to the boys after, you know, people were calling them, you know, uh, knocking the color. Why are they always the same color and different things like that. But that's something that most people never see. I've never heard of that before. That's pretty cool. So, but I have all kinds of, you know, I've kept everything from my original uh, Nike tennis shoes, my complete outfits from WrestleMania two, three, four. Um, of course, I was at five. I got paid, but I didn't participate because I had given my notice, and um, you know, Vince knew that I didn't want to do job, do a job, uh, heading out. And it was really good because all of the um, the independents were so hot, and we went to so many places. I mean, I should go get a ticket. I have uh, I'm going to put in my book actually as well. It's uh, from Kota Kintabalu on the island of Sabah off the Malaysian coast. How many people have ever wrestled there? <laughs> well, the Nasty Boys were there. Frenchie Martin, some tremendous stories from there. Brady Boone. Um, just a, just an awesome time awesome time. promoted that um that was promoted by uh, a guy named mehar singh okay uh, an indian guy so i went to india twice um once for mehar singh and once for a guy named dylan and we have one of the greatest ribs ever recorded that's actually recorded on video with Bertha Singh, who this guy, this promoter Dylan insisted that Bertha come to the show. And so Hal Jeffrey was the American promoter along with myself. I remember meeting uh, in the Tampa Palms Gold's gym of mine in which Steve Kern was on 20% of, my, of that particular Gold's gym. And uh, Steve's one of my best friends. I see him constantly. And um, um obviously we we did really really well in the gym business so uh um, this guy dylan who i had never met hal jeffrey had met him somewhere and um hal jeffrey actually promoted the uh bahama show that was dwayne johnson's first match with his father rocky in, in a tag team match and uh hal is hal was the minister for the tampa bay buccaneers and he saw things that most ministers never see. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, we pulled this tremendous rib on Dylan because he was in love with Bertha. And do uh, you, you remember Bertha Singh, Rhonda? Yeah, she was in w Bertha Faye in WWE, right? Right, exactly. And just a wonderful woman. I mean, I don't know what it was that Dylan saw, but... Uh, he just fell in, he was enamored with her. And um, that long, I, I can't, I don't want to really go into the whole, I, actually, I'd like to show you the video sometime because not too many people get to see this. But uh, uh, we happened to all be in rooms. Uh, David Sierra was there, uh, the Cuban assassin. Uh, this guy, Nasty Ned. And um, I'm trying to think of the kid from Brandon that had the camera. But uh, we, uh, um, Dylan wanted to be with Rhonda so bad, you know, he, he said, uh, he came up to me one morning at breakfast, the first or second day of the tour, it was like a 10 day tour, eight day tour. And he said, Brian, I'm so in love with Rhonda. I've got to have Rhonda. What do I do to get Rhonda? 
I said, uh, well, Dylan, you know, I, I don't know, but you, one thing you have to make sure is that Bam Bam doesn't see. He said, what? I said, yeah, uh, Bam Bam, uh, they're an item. You know what I mean? Oh, no, it cannot be. I said, yes, Dylan, it is. But it's okay. I said, Rhonda's cool, and I think she really likes you. Oh, really? So anyway, uh, the rib went from there. Uh, Rhonda called uh, Dylan up, and we had written down some demands that we wanted from Dylan, and we had noticed that all the rooms had two um, side tables. Now, remember, this is on film. Uh, they have two side tables, and um, uh, they were queen size or full size beds. And uh, so we had uh, on the list of things that Rhonda had to get were uh, athletic tape, a bottle of uh, either Chevis Regals, expensive scotch, like $150 a bottle there, um, shaving cream, uh, razors, um, there was something else, a blindfold, um, a whip. Um, and um, so, he, you know, Dylan was anxious to get all this stuff. And so he got it all together. And it's after the matches, we all get in our room or either that or we had the day off. I can't remember exactly. Um, and um, so um, Rhonda calls Dylan up. Now, remember, we're all of us are in rooms side by side by side by side. And uh, so Rhonda calls Dylan up. We we planned it perfectly. We told Rhonda, look, uh, get to Dylan's room, and uh, then you're going to tie him up uh, and put on a show for us. And we're going to, when you get him tied up and blindfolded, tell him you got to go to your room for a second to get something. Uh, you know, just, you know, put it in your own words. I mean, you can do it, Rhonda. And uh, she was all excited. And what a fabulous job Rhonda did. I mean, absolutely fabulous. Talking so sexy. I mean, uh, God, it was crazy. So uh, um, when, when the time comes when she has to tell Dylan, I, I just need to go to my room for a second, she's going to come back in and shut the door, but then leave it open a crack so that we can come in. And uh, Kevin was his name from Brandon. So Kevin could set up... Uh, I can't think of his last name. So he could, uh, I, it'll come to me. But uh, so he could set up the little, he had this portable tripod thing. So you just set it down and there it goes. So uh, we had it all planned out. Rhonda, you put on the show when the time's right. Bam Bam's going to slam the door and jump in and say, hey, what are you doing? Da, da, da. So everything went, was, it, I mean, it was absolutely perfect, Devin. And so, uh, She's uh, got him naked on the bed, and it looks like evolution passed him up. Not that I believe in evolution, but, uh, you know, he's just like a hairy mammoth. <laughs> he looks like, and uh, she's slapping his willy and putting shave cream all over him. And, oh, Rhonda, what are you doing, Rhonda? I, oh, but I like it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And the conversation's going back and forth, and all of a sudden she starts to pour some of the scotch on him. Oh, Rhonda, that's very expensive. What are you doing with that scotch? Oh, don't worry, Dylan, I'm going to lick it off of you. Oh, okay, okay. And he starts trembling. And and again, this is all on film. And it was hilarious, yeah. all the stuff in between. And pretty soon, we couldn't take it anymore. I mean, literally, we had uh, snot coming out of our nose, noses trying to keep from laughing because it was just <laughs> the greatest show you could imagine. And all of a sudden, when Bam Bam... He, he comes in and he slams the door and he goes, hey, Dylan, what are you doing with my old lady? He goes, the he rips the whole tape from one wrist and curls up into a fetal position and he's going, no, bang, bang, no, bang, bang. This is a dream. This is a dream. And, and so he's trying to convince uh, Bam Bam, he's calling him Bang Bang, that it's a dream. And so, you know, it was obviously not a dream and... Uh, so Bam Bam like slaps him on the foot and says, next time I catch you with my old lady, I'm going to slit your throat. And we left, did, just went to the rooms, were laughing so hard, laughing so hard. The next morning at uh, breakfast again, Dylan comes up to me and he goes, oh, Brian, a terrible thing happened to me. And I'm playing dumb, obviously. And I said, what happened, Dylan? He said, oh. You're right. 
Bam Bam and Dylan, uh, Bam Bam and Bertha are an item. I did not know that, and Bertha came to my room. She and she asked to come to my room. I did not ask her, but she came to my room, and um, I just have to go to the mosque and say some prayers. So I must leave you now, but I will be back. And I said, okay, Dylan. And so he left to some mosque or whatever. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was it was just so absolutely off the chain hilarious and to know that we have that on film is even funnier does he know that it's on film uh, he has no idea oh that's hilarious no idea whatsoever so you know i've just sat on it i don't i don't know what to do <laughs> i entertain some of my friends once in a while with it. so Play it at Cauliflower Alley on the screen. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> this is full triple X, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do now, that. we didn't have the camera rolling a second ago. You had that trophy. Could you uh, show that trophy again so I could get it on tape? Sure. So, um, obviously, you're going to be able to edit this. So, do you want me to go? you want me to start talking about Herb and the... Uh, that's part of the herb story. You're, yes. you're just gonna pull it. Okay, I'll uh, I'll open it up then, and then I'll just edit. Uh, I'll edit the the rib story into the to the full shoot interview later. Okay, so I'll introduce you, and I'll get into it then. This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today we have a return guest here on the Great North Wrestling Podcast. He is the president of the Cauliflower Alley Club, WWE legend, UWF Booker, we've just found out. Uh, he's one of the stars of the Dark Side of the Ring documentary on Herb Abrams, the killer bee himself. B. Brian Blair, how are you doing today, sir? Doing awesome, Devin. It's so good to be on your show again. Thanks for having me. You're looking well. Uh, have you still been managed managing to work out to, despite this lockdown? Oh, absolutely. I have a gym in my house. I have um, an elliptical, a treadmill, um, a Stairmaster, dumbbells, and, of course, DDPY yoga, which is one of my favorite things, especially since I had a back operate, back surgery last August. Um, I actually wrestled a, a week before my back surgery, which I shouldn't have done. Um, and then I had shoulder surgery. Um, it uh, was just three months on the uh, 29th of April. So I'm um, just now, you know, all that's finally that was my 15th operation from the wrestling industry. I mean, I don't know if you can see right here. I've had multiple, multiple stitches in my hand. Uh, I got stabbed here. I got uh, tore, did that. Arn, uh, went to hit Tully Blanchard, was wrestling Arn Anderson and Tully in Hamilton, Ontario. A bunch of people didn't show up. Grizzly Smith asked me to go on again for the third time. And so uh, I finally succumbed to his wishes. Uh, he assured me that, you know, Brunzel and I both had to work three times and uh, he assured us that we would be paid you know and compensated fully for all three matches I mean we got paid but not fully for all three matches but um, that's what I got out of that and then in Japan um, I had keto in the ropes um, in the corner we were in Hiroshima one of the first times uh, that I've ever seen the Japanese get this mad Paul Orndorff and Big John Studd um uh actually i have a picture right here i love visual aids excuse me one second take this off here um paul Orndorff and big john stud were my tag team partners and um we uh were wrestling uh tatsumi fujinami uh enoki and keto and they were in the other corner and i had keto in my corner and you know, I'm working him over and um, all of a sudden I feel something hit my feet and uh, it was a fan trying to, you know, keto was a real good baby face. And um, uh, so uh, uh, then, a, then a couple more people started to come in, which you don't really see in Japan. Those people are very well behaved fans. And, you know, if you've ever you've watched everything, but when you watch Japanese wrestling, you notice that the audience re reacts completely different than the uh, fans in Europe or America. And, um, 
Or they're much more polite. They'll clap for a high spot, even for the heels, even for the bad guys, usually. But this time we had real, real heat. And so Keto got scared and I was grabbed him by the trunks because he wanted to get away. And I didn't want him to get away, but he leaped with his hands. And when he did, my two fingers went and just popped the two tendons right there. So the doctors cut down all the way down to here looking for my tendons. They never found them. So they had to sew my uh, these three fingers right here together. So if I you know, hold one, they all have to move together because they're all so, sewn to this pinky finger. And I've had four knee surgeries, a knee replacement, uh, you know, just so many injuries, four concussions. Um, got, uh, Donald Trump uh, in WrestleMania two. Uh, Andre threw me over the top rope and, you know, we're in the middle of this deal. I didn't know who Donald Trump was even, and other than we were res- wrestling at some rich guy's casino. And when uh, he threw me over the top rope, he was laughing. And uh, Andre and I used to have a lot of fun together. And sometimes he, he took it a little too far. You know, I mean, he's so strong, you, you just didn't realize, you know, how strong Andre was. And I, he threw me so hard, I couldn't catch the top rope. So on my chin, back then, there was no protective barriers like you see now. And it was just a steel rail. My chin hit the uh, that 14 stitches here. My chin hit the rail and blood starts pumping out. And I hear this lady say, uh, Donald, I think that's real blood. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, no kidding, lady. Wow. Uh, and this man stands up in a nice suit and says, uh, um, uh, Killer B or uh, Brian, whatever he said, he said, can I help you? And nobody's coming to help me. Everybody's watching the match. And the blood's just... So he grabbed the handkerchief out of his uh, suit pocket. He put it on my chin. And he walked me all the way to the back. He stayed with me right there until the ambulance came. And he missed the whole, uh, you know, the whole battle royal. And uh, I thought that was pretty nice of him. But I got a lot of stories with the injuries uh, as... You know, they, they happen in the ring. You know, there's kind of a story with every one of them. So, so I'm guessing that bottom of vote in later years from you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, I, people know I was a politician. And, you know, my dad's a Democrat. He's my best friend. I love, I love my dad so much. He's 86 years old until the hard rock closed because of the pandemic. My, my dad does two or three crossword puzzles at six or seven in the morning He'll read half a novel. Uh, I gave him Forrest Scott Stevens novels uh, about uh, two weeks ago. He brought them back a week ago, and he had read all four of them. And uh, that's just the kind of guy he is. But he plays poker every day at the Hard Rock, and there's no way he could lose because he's won the bad beat before, which is like 50000 was how much he won at that time. And he wins high hands, and he spends a lot of time there, and he'll never – bet more than a hundred dollars so he doesn't have a gambling problem he does it to stay mentally sharp and at 86 years old you know it's uh you know between you and i uh well i guess it's not between you and i but i guess i've already gotten myself in this far so he asked me for one of those little blue pills the other day so (laughs) that's the kind of he sucks your old dad you know to to have so um it was uh, he's a he's a great dad and politics is just in my blood you know i've been an elected county official um been a businessman started one gold's gym um built four of my own leased three others out um public record that i sold them debt free for 2.1 million dollars and um i've um always appreciated my colleagues and the guys that gave me a break and um the guys around me because you know one of my all-time worst sayings that somebody came up with from somewhere is enhancement talent because everybody on that card is important and especially the first match the first match sets the tone for the whole night so the main event you could take hogan and macho man during the height of their career and put them anywhere. And if that was the only match and you had all a bunch, a whole bunch of unknown people underneath there, you wouldn't have near the crowds 
that you had. So it's a package, you know, it's a package deal. So, you know, I, I appreciate every one of the guys and that's why I am so into the cauliflower alley club. And, um, I appreciate your support. I appreciate Hannibal TV's support of the cauliflower alley club. We have some tremendous ambassadors that really speak hard for us from Dwayne Johnson to, um, of course, Jim Ross has been one of our biggest cheerleaders forever. And Mark Henry, and now is, and for the last few years has been a tremendous supporter of the Cauliflower Alley Club, uh, David Arquette, Dallas Page. You know, these guys uh, are constantly, recently Al Snow uh, jumped on board and uh, as a life member and wants to help. And they realize what we, what good we do. We have the most efficient, effective charity probably in the world uh, right now i know we are the number one most efficient charity in the united states of america we give away 99.5 plus percent of every dollar we take in the only money that we spend is for the newsletter that our members get four newsletters every year that you can't get on the internet and um you know we uh we have a reunion every year we had to postpone this one that was in april until september uh, 21st through the 23rd, uh, which will happen in Vegas. Um, I'm pretty sure of that now. Um, yeah, we're all scheduled and um, we have more and more and more enthusiasm building for the Cauliflower Alley Club because we are just helping so many people. I mean, we don't mention names, Devin. Um, usually we don't mention names, but we've helped guys like, you know, that have given us permission, Kamala, um, you know, saved, saved his home. Uh, it's, we've done tremendous stuff with James is such a wonderful person. Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan. And, and, and guys, you know, uh, you know, guys that were opening matches, as long as you had been in the business for three years, that's the requirement. Um, then uh, whether you're a referee and or an announcer or as long as you're a part of the business, we, we help these people. And there's so many that fall on dire financial times because there's no 401k. We don't have insurance and most of them are, are health related reasons. So, uh, it's such an honor to be able to give back to all of those men and women that not only helped my career but helped all the people i know's career um, it takes everybody i mean i'm thankful for george hackenschmidt and for tragos and Thez and all the people that blazed the trail long before us because without them we would never have the business that we have yes it's a great organization and another guy that i know wanted to be mentioned that you helped him was rip oliver which i believe you paid some of his bills before he passed away Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we paid his, he was about to lose all of his property. So we paid all of his property taxes off. Uh, you know, everybody wants to leave their kids something when they pass away. Um, at least that's how I feel. And, um, and that's how Rip felt. And he was very upset that he was going to lose his property. Um, I believe it was 10 acres and um, the home on his property that he was, because he was going to die, he knew he was going to die, and um, you know, sadly, uh, and Billy Jack Haynes helped him out a lot. I know Billy Jack gets a bad rap sometimes, but he was really, really right there for Rip the the entire way. And my hats off to Billy Jack for all that he did for Rip. Um, when I was at the funeral, he had such a wonderful family. Um, it was just so great to meet his family and and to know that now he could leave something to them that they'll where they grew up i mean and they'll have that for as long as they want to have it now i believe the april cauliflower alley club was sold out is does that go on for the september one as well all the tickets are still well it wasn't sold out we, we were far ahead of any uh, of any of our past reunions and we have sold out the last few years so um um, the, we think we will be sold out again in September and, um, we only had, uh, out of, I don't know, 370 people that had already bought tickets up to that point, up until COVID came up, uh, 60 people asked for refunds. And okay. 
of course, we refunded their money. And then we had a tragic thing happen. Uh, Dean Silverstone passed away and, and uh, our treasurer for 27 years. And uh, so we've had to pick up the pieces there. And fortunately, we have, we have some of the greatest volunteers. And all of our volunteers, they go there on their own dime. Um, they, they go there and um, pay their own hotel room. Everybody pays for everything, just like you do and everybody else that participates. So that's why we are so efficient. Now, I heard on another topic, Arne Anderson not too long ago talk about a fight that you had with Matt Bourne that he said was one of the most brutal fights he ever saw. You ended up biting Matt's lip off. I was wondering if I could get to your version of those events. Sure. We were in a bar. Um, I don't know. I. I I can't remember the exact city. I, something tells me it was Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, and it's Flair's favorite. Ric Flair loves to tell the story. But um, Matt Bourne came up to me. Dick Murdoch was there. Killer Carl Cox. Um, you know, uh, Ric Flair. Just, uh, so many of the guys were there. Matt Bourne was new into the WWE, WWF, and he wanted to, I guess, make a name for himself. So he came up to me and he said, um, why are you messing with my girlfriend? And I said, excuse me, Matt, I don't, you know, I didn't really know Matt. I said, uh, who's your girlfriend? I didn't know I was messing with your girlfriend. Who's your girlfriend? He said, uh, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, or something he mumbled to me. And I said, okay, well, just, you know, have a good night. And, you know, I don't believe that there's no girls here that I'm messing around with. So if your girlfriend's here, I'm certainly not me. So as I turn, he sucker punches me and the back of the head. And he goes to uh, suplex me from behind. And as he did when I was in the air, I spun around on top of him and wound up on the ground and he's grabbing my ears and my hair at the same time and he's trying to bite my nose so i saw his lip since he was trying to and his teeth and so since he was trying to bite my nose i went ahead and bit his lip off and spit it out and then i beat him up all i had to beat him up and i thought the fight was over so uh, you know, guys take them somewhere and everybody's having a drink and all of a sudden out of nowhere, somebody jumps on my back. It's mad again. <laughs> jumps back in my back. Boom, boom, boom. We start fighting again. Finally, again, it's subdued. Uh, beat him up some more. His head looked like a, a swollen pumpkin. And um, I never started a fight ever. Um, but I've been in six pretty brutal fights and I never lost one. Not that I'm, I'm not, believe me, I'm very humble and I'm not bragging or anything because I, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of people that can kick my butt on my best day. Um, and that goes for everybody. So you just never know. That's why it's always better to be humble and just get along with people. And I've always felt like that. I don't, I don't feel like I'm better than any fan that buys a ticket or the guy that picks up my trash. I'm just, we're all equal. We're all human beings and we treat each other with respect. And that's the kind of life that I've believed in for so, so long. And, um, and then, so the third, now the third time the bar's getting ready to close. Now this is about an hour. Well, maybe not an hour, about, I don't know, a half hour later, maybe. And, uh, Matt Bourne comes back and I'll, I'll never, Matt Bourne comes back, hits me again from, well, he went to hit me and somebody said something and I turned around and we started rolling again and boom, um, uh, all of a sudden I'm trying to drag him to the door and he trips me as I'm trying to drag him to the door and or i fell and i think he put his leg out and which is a good move matt was a wrestler before and so i go down and as i come up he's got his finger in my eye and uncle ivan uh, koloff was sitting there and he kicked matt's 
hand and he said, no eyes. Uh, thank you, Uncle Ivan. God bless you. And uh, so that that was the end of this, the story. But that fight went on for probably 15 minutes in total. Why are the bouncers letting them back in? What's that? Why, Why would, would the bouncers let him back in if he kept causing that? That's crazy. I have no idea, Devin. I have no idea. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but someone told me you were allegedly also in a scrap with Buzz Sawyer. Was yes. that true? Yes. That was one of the six. That was one of the six. Buzz Sawyer, um, Matt Bourne, Bobby Jaggers, Moondog Spot, Doug Summers. Um, uh, I remember the Doug Summers story from uh, the first shoot interview you did. That one was very personal, and that's that's understandable. But we know that uh, Mad Dog, we've heard that he was always on a lot of stuff and highly uncontrollable, I guess. So was he just pushing your buttons the wrong way that night, or...? Yeah, you know, I don't really like to talk about the deceased uh, so much. And Matt, uh, Buzz was a good guy. He's from across the bay. Uh, we were friends. I, I just wish that I had the match that him and I had in Hartford, Connecticut. I believe it was Hartford. Um, we had a 15-minute Broadway or a draw, 15-minute draw. Some people don't understand the old terms. But uh, if they asked you... In the old days to do a broadway that meant to go through the time limit and it was the first time we ever worked together and it was like magic i mean the people they just were so engrossed and chief jay strongbow came up to me afterwards and said bbb he's always got it bbb he goes bbb that was that was probably the best match i ever saw in my life i wish we i wish we would have had 30 minutes and, you know he just would talk in the different way you got to understand chief i love chief uh, a lot of people you know chief was kind of the office stooge but that was his job and um he was so electrified over that match he would just every all the time talk to me about that and i've yet to find anybody that can find that match hmm. well maybe someone will see this and search it up for us uh one question a lot of people wanted me to ask you um, was, I guess, somebody wrote in a book recently that the thing between you and Iron Sheik was a big work. I don't know if you can answer that or not, but uh, well, that, I guess, recently came out. Uh, no, uh, yes, no. Um, it started in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I thought it was really... Over, Sheik and I used to shoot a little bit at the beginning of the match, and once in a while he'd hook me, and once in a while I'd hook him. And um, we were in Hershey, and um, he said something to uh, Nikolai, his partner, Nikolai Volkov, great guy. And I see, I hear him talking in the corner before the matches start. So him and I start, and uh, we do a little thing, and. Um, well, he, he has me in a front face lock, and all of a sudden he's sh shooting on the front face lock on me. I'm like, Damn, sheep! But I didn't want to. I didn't want to give him. I didn't want to tap him. And he and I saw the wrist, so I double. I wound up double wrist locking him. And Nikolai was like a ah, cheeky, what you gonna do? Ah, cheeky, ah, cheeky. And he's going oh, me, 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 me. And so you know he finally tapped, and and now Nikolai rode his butt. I mean, it, it, you know. I can't imagine what he said to him in the car. They were always riding together, you know, and Jimmy and I were off in another car. So I, I have no idea. But uh, apparently that got to him so much that he didn't forgive me for that. Then when we were at that uh, roast, um, um, <laughs> that was funny. I'll, I'll never forget um, um, uh Razor Ramon's coming through the back of the curtain. Um, I don't know if that's on the tape of that or not. but uh, I've, I think I've seen that. He was a little uh, inebriated or something that night. Yes, 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 yes. But um, uh, somebody said, uh, 
you know, she wasn't being real cordial to me that night. And um, I, don't know, I don't know what the deal was. I, it was like it was since that that last night in Hershey he was he was kind of different. And um, so they said, um, well, you know, uh, she uh, might get upset with you or uh, uh, he might push you or something. And, uh, you know, just let it ride because it's a chic roast. You know, we don't want anything done. Well, uh, he didn't push me. He slapped me and he slapped the pee out of me really hard. And so it was kind of set up, but not set up to be slapped like that. And it took everything that I had to keep from jumping on him. But again, it was the packed house and a lot of people and I, I just wanted to be a gentleman and so I was a gentleman and that's that's the story and by that time I mean his health was already on the downward and you you're obviously still in shape even with before your back surgery you were wrestling what a 25 year old or so a couple okay. days before yeah I can wrestle right now now I mean um I don't have any fat on me at all. I mean, I punch. But, uh, yeah, I stay in shape. Uh, uh, I enjoy staying in shape. I mean, age is a number. Um, I w I, there's no way I could go out and carry a schedule like the guys do now, but um, I could certainly go out and wrestle in my fifth decade. And a fan wanted me to ask you, I mean, I've seen you guys at conventions. You just basically ignore each other. He's He's really suffering now anyways. But, like, you guys don't have any confrontations now, right? It's pretty much over. No, no, it's over. Uh, you know, he, he, I've got to give him a lot of credit. He told me one day, he said, BBB, I'm really sorry um, for whatever, you know, um, I forget exactly how he put it. And, you know, I had a real deep sorrow in my heart for Cosro because his daughter had died uh, from an overdose and, you know, him and his wife, Carol, were getting a divorce. They, they're back together. I know now. And, um, uh, she's gotta be a very, very strong woman to stay with Cosro through all the stuff. And, uh, you know, I know I don't like to have heat with anybody. Um, it's just not my nature. And, uh, I'm glad that the hatchet was buried, but I never knew all those clips were on. <laughs> There's so many clips on the internet. Um, and you know funny cartoons and all this and i didn't know that till like five years ago somebody said oh you got to see all these clips they're hilarious and i said what clips you know they, oh, they got you and chic and I, I can't believe the effort that some people went through i don't know who, who even did it to do all these cartoons and uh, you you probably see them because you watch everything Devin. but anyway i I, uh, I try not to watch some of them some of those are pretty explicit yeah <laughs> too explicit it's not something i'd want my two boys to watch <laughs> now a fan had a question for me to ask he said he noticed that you were in a lot of double dqs when you were in wwe um not a lot of clean finishes that might just be his perspective um did you notice that there was a lot of not clean finishes or was that just his perspective no, you know, I, I'm sure, well, I know we had several like that, but um, I, I really don't like double DQs. I'd rather do a job if it's done right. Um, but um, it, it just, uh, again, if it's done right, um, it's, you know, we do what the booker says. Um, I've always been of that mindset, you know, I don't, not that I haven't resisted doing a job, I have. And, um, you know, once you get to a certain point in the business, you know, everybody does. It's just, you know, where, you, where you're going. Greg Valentine actually told me that he, re he actually left WWE, I think, or almost left due to having to job to the Killer Bees at one point. Did you ever hold anything against him for that? No, I stretched him every time we got in the ring. Ask him. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say, he used to uh, go, oh, please, 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 oh, don't do it. And I'd, 
always, if you ever watch her matches, you know, it's a, uh, maybe seven out of 10 of them, it's a shoot takedown. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I, you know, Greg, uh, we all have a role to play. You know, sometimes you're up here and, you know, I've, I've been on the top of the card and I've been on the bottom of the card and I've been everywhere on the card and I don't care just as long as I'm on the card and as long as I'm making enough money to feed my family, to pay my bills, whatever, that's the kind of uh, mindset that I always had. Unfortunately, when I was younger, I listened to a tape called The Richest Man in Babylon. And between listening to that tape, which the premise is to save 10% of all your money, and put it in a different account and it's your first bill before you even pay your light bill or your mortgage or whatever you pay your abc bill or your 10 percent. and uh, you know it sunk in and i did that and i you always hear as a wrestler it's not how much you make kid it's how much you save um you know riding with great wonderful coaches like the briscoe brothers um you know i miss jack so much uh, he was one of my greatest friends um Oh, gosh. Uh, behind me is a picture of Jack and I um, back there. But, um, you know, he's I, I, I've got, uh, you know, when Rocky Johnson just passed away, that tore me up. Um, you know, I loved Rocky so much. Uh, I can't even explain how much I loved Rocky Johnson. Um, and through all the years, I was in high school when I met Rocky. And I remember I was at the matches and I, I just was so impressed with this guy that had these giant pecs and the body he had and the moves that he could do and everything. And Buddy Colt was uh, apparently Rocky and Buddy worked all over the United States of America and drew a lot of money. And for a lot of people don't know this. Rocky Johnson was in a program in every territory that they ever worked in, except for maybe the first you know couple like everybody else uh, in Canada or he broke in and you know i love canada um matter of fact toronto was always my favorite town to work in but um more so the madison square garden and um uh mr t was our manager there but uh, just just thinking out loud but um uh my mind just wandered go back to the question please Devin. Uh, uh you kind of veered off onto rocky johnson oh yeah so we're at the uh armory in tampa and um all of a sudden, this guy comes up to me and hands me a, a, a popcorn and a soda. And I, he said, here, this is from Mr. Johnson. And apparently, Buddy Colt told Rocky how much I was a fan of his. And Rocky, I looked up and Rocky was getting popcorn. He had popcorn and a soda in his hand. And Buddy told him that I was a very you know, poor kid, which I was. Um, I got busted with food stamps in the fifth grade. It was unbelievable story that'll be in my book coming out and uh, there's a lot of things i don't say because i have to save things for the book that i've been writing for a couple of years now but we'll, we'll be done by uh by the end of the year and scott stevens who's a tremendous he's got top novels all over the world um he uh is helping me with the book he's a tremendous guy um formatting it things like that every word in it is words from my mouth or someone else's mouth um but um it's all it's all true 100 percent shoot stuff so um oh excuse me uh, tony marino you can, you can take that if you want <laughs> nah i'm gonna call him back when we're done you know tony marino only the name uh, he, uh tony was a unique character he was um he wrestled with bruno a lot back in the day before the day and um he's 88 years old now and uh again i try to help a lot of the guys and i just encouraged a lot of people to write to him at the uh health and rehab center at uh 518 west fletcher avenue in tampa florida and um if you write to um dino lonza at um tampa health and rehab 518 west fletcher avenue you know it makes him feel good he's like a a star you know um getting the fan mail and the nurses treat him extra good and i just came up with that idea and i mentioned it 
I guess on Twitter and Facebook and all of a sudden he's getting all this fan mail and he is, he is just so happy. And especially during this COVID-19 time when, you know, you can't really go into those kind of facilities, uh, they don't want you in there. And, um, so, uh, I appreciate everybody that's mailed, uh, Dino Lanza, uh, AKA Batman. He went as Batman, uh, Tony Marino for a long time. Do you have any stories about the ultimate warrior? I know your paths must have crossed for a few years there in WWE. Yeah, it did. And, um, uh, you know, um, the warrior was kind of, uh, more reclusive than most people. Uh, he did have a few friends, uh, that were close to him. I was never a real close friend, uh, um, but, uh, you know, we were always cordial to each other. We always shared locker room stories. He was always around uh, some of the great bulldog ribs. And, uh, you know, we'd laugh together. And um, uh, he was a hard, he worked out hard, hard, hard in the gym. And, um, but as far as any real stories that would be of interest uh, to your audience, I would say that um, that I don't have anything other than to say what a what a very very uh, nice person that he was to to me. I never saw him be upset with the other guys uh, around him, so I have nothing but praises for him. And speaking of the Bulldogs, uh, Jacques Rougeau wanted me to tell you hello. Yeah, please uh, tell me hello. I will. Any memories of working with the Rougeau brothers? Oh, yeah, I loved working with Jacques and Ramon. And, you know, I'll never forget. Um, I was very upset with Jacques uh, when he hit Dynamite, but uh, with the roll of quarters. Uh, I was right there. Brunzel and I were right there around the corner. Um, Tommy went to get some coffee. and But, you know, I understand Jacques. Maybe not the roll of quarters, and a sucker punch, but I understand him wanting to kick Tommy's ass because the ribs were getting out of control. I mean, it was brutal. The ribs that they did, they were just, you know, beyond when you start messing with people's clothes and their bags and things that are going to cost money. To me, that's, that's not a good rib. And I, you know, I, I love Davy boy. I mean, the Hart family is like an extended family of mine, just like the Von Erics. And, um, um, you know, it was just uh, sad to see that happen. And um, at the time, I was I was really upset to see Tommy with his teeth knocked out, bleeding like that, knowing that he got sucker punched. Um, I, I didn't like that. But, in, you know, you have to really think and put everything into perspective. And it took me a few days to really put everything into perspective and to realize that, you know, that was just Jock's uh, way. And I'm sure Ramon was... You know, their brothers, I'm sure they were coaching each other on. And I don't think the Bulldogs knew that they had gone that far. And um, it is what it is. And it happened. And, um, you know, I, 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 I still love Jock and Ramon. I think they're, you know, two talented athletes. Um, Ramon is, is an extremely smart business guy. Um, you know, Jock is, uh, he didn't fall off a turnip truck either. So, um, you know, they're, they're both, uh, they're both good guys. And, and, you know, in the business, you, you have a lot of pressure on you. I mean, I remember speaking of Greg Valentine, I remember one time he was ready to quit. And so were Jimmy and I, because we had worked 67 days straight, many double shots during that time, several different countries, and with no days off and that that's just so hard on somebody's body Devin and that's you know that's why I've had uh, 15 operations from the business is because you you know I've always been under the premise that whether there's a hundred people or or 50,000 or a hundred thousand whatever 10,000 you work the same way you, each person that's there paid their hard-earned money so you have to go out there and perform to the best of your ability and um, uh, that's just the way it was. And um, just so many great memories. Ugh. 
Now, before the Herb Abrams episode aired, you appeared on uh, after the after whatever it's called, uh, Dark Side of the Ring, the special on David Schultz. You had some stuff to say about that. I didn't. I wasn't able to find that episode, but I was wondering if you could just share some of your thoughts on David Schultz and the slapping incident. Yeah, I was right there when it happened. Uh, I was getting ready to go back to Florida to win the Florida heavyweight title. And I made, because uh, I, w- I wrestled for Vince Sr. And, um, you know, I had wrestled on two different, uh, like, year-long stints with WWF because, or WWWF, uh, before they dropped the F, and uh, the Florida tape from Channel 44 WTOG with Gordon Sully went to New York and uh, to the northeastern area of the country. So people got to kind of see my career grow up, and um, I had a great time there. Vince, Vince McMahon Sr. was perhaps the most honest, um, easiest guy to talk to as far as a promoter that I've ever been around. And I'll never forget one day we were in Hamburg and um, there was a stair where we did TV and then there was one bathroom. And Vincent Mann was so humble that there'd be a line, he'd stand at the back of the line. And so Hulkster was behind Vince and I was behind Hulkster and everybody's talking, kind of getting their way to the restroom. And um, uh, Vince goes into the bathroom and he, senior, goes into the bathroom, he doesn't shut the door, him and Terry are still talking, you know, most of the guys just went to the bathroom. So, um, so uh, Vince leaves and uh, Terry says, uh, he says, Brian, look at this. And I looked and the toilet bowl was full of blood. So we didn't know what was going on, but Vince had just urinated pure blood and he was so I guess engrossed in talking to Terry that he didn't flush the toilet and it was there and um, it was a very sad day because uh, I knew something was very wrong with him then I found out about the cancer and uh, I just still remember Vince Jr. sitting with um, his dad in a wheelchair and, and Vince Jr. was a wonderful son to his dad that I saw um, I, I've never seen tears in Vince Jr.'s eyes until one day uh, he was talking to his dad and uh, just stood up and he had tears in his eyes and you know I knew that you know that what was going to happen and it was just a very 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 uh, tough time but Vince was a class act so as you were saying, you were on your way out. Obviously, Senior and Eddie Graham had a relationship. Yeah, and I guess you you witnessed that and the commotion in the dressing room afterwards. Yeah, because when I went to go to Florida, uh, Vince Senior actually, you know, uh, it's a long story. I don't want to give, I may have told you, but, you know, my, my nickname that my mom gave me is Bieber and like Justin Bieber. Yeah. And, and so she'd call me Bieber when I was young and my brothers and sisters, they couldn't say Brian when they grew grown up. So they always called me B. Um, I guess my dad just told them to call me B and cause we're like all five of us, well, four of us are a year apart. And then I have a younger brother, Mike, um, um, that's, uh, from another mother. And, um, my parents were divorced when I was 13. Um, but, uh, uh, I've always been very close to them. My mom lives in my guest house. Uh, I just saw her on the dock right now, just a little bit ago, throwing bread to the fish. Uh, so that's uh, it's a real blessing having your mom and dad alive at the age of 86, and my mom's 80. So um, it's 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 a blessing that uh, I, I can take care of my mom. You know, she can never live on a $600 a month Social Security check. So uh, um, that that became uh, kind of taboo as I was getting older. I didn't want anybody to know about Bieber, especially. B was okay. And so 
uh, buddy Colt, uh, you know, the story, uh, he, my mom called, uh, uh, during my first match, my mother called, uh, the, the armory up and Charlie lay said, buddy, you got a phone call, but he went and took the phone call. All the boys are there. The brisk, everybody's there. Don Morocco, Jimmy Garvin, uh, a whole bunch of guys. They had pulled so many ribs on me. Uh, but, uh, but he comes back and he says, uh, um, hey, I just got a call from your mother and uh, I, I, I was working against Pat Patterson. It was Skip Young and I against Pat Patterson and Ivan Koloff. And uh, but he says, uh, please don't hurt her Bieber. <laughs> so, so right away, Dusty's leaned back in that chair at the office and he goes, Bieber. So he put a P in it instead of a B. So he always called me Bieber. And so then Orndorff started calling me Beeper, and I tried to put the lid on that. But anyway, Vince Senior uh, knew about the story, and he said, why don't you be B. Brian Blair? He said, there's a lot of Brian Blairs in this world. He said, I don't know of any B. Brian Blair, and you are B. Brian Blair. Why don't you be B. Brian Blair? I said, that's fine with me, sir. I, I like it. And so then I was B. Brian Blair because of Vince Senior. So... Wow. And now only uh, pretty much you're the only Brian Blair, too. So you've outlived all the other ones that or you've become more famous than any other ones that may have existed, I guess. Well, no, there's uh, just in Hillsborough County where I live, there's probably 75 Brian Blairs. Oh, but I mean, for wrestlers. Oh, OK. Yeah. Now, you just mentioned Paul Orndorff. I just had a fan question. I'll slip in here quick. Uh, a fan wanted to know if Paul and Hogan got along behind the scenes. Yes and no. Um, they were always cordial to each other, but, um, you know, there was a little animosity, and those guys had some matches that were just off the chain. Um, I remember one of the cage matches in the Cap Center, and... Uh, uh, I got his picture on the wall, Joe, uh, the coach, uh, Joe uh, from the Washington Redskins, um, brought his uh, kids there, and um, he was such a fan after that match, uh, the cage match, because in, sometimes in W, it was weird, in, in WWF, WWE, they would put the main event on, you know, in the middle of the car, and yeah. and these guys had a cage match that was absolutely incredible. And I remember ribbing Paul that night because his arm was starting to shrink up and he came up to me and he says, uh, beeper. He says, uh, I, I need to do some doubt shine Hogan tonight. You got any suggestions? I said, let me think for a minute. And I said, uh, yeah, he goes, okay, okay. Tell me, you know, Paul would get so excited over everything. Okay. Okay. What is it? I said, well, you know how he does the bow and arrow and the pose and all that? I said, you know, your legs are better than Hogan's and your abs are better too. So why don't you uh, emulate him and uh, do that stuff? I said, then show him your abs and flick the abs off. I said, then show him the quads and, and you know, make, make, make his, uh, do his thing. Like Hogan ain't got that, you know, Hogan ain't got that. <laughs> and, uh, so, and so I said, then what I want you to do is break right down into the fiddler crab. And I don't know if you know what a fiddler crab is, but they only have one arm. Right. So, so Paul didn't get it at first. He goes, this is great. Oh, this is fabulous. So about two minutes later, he comes back to me. He goes, oh, man, you're ribbing me because of my arm. Oh, you son of a gun. And he went on and on because he loved it. He loved it so much, right? It, it just, you know, Paul, some things took a minute to sink in for Paul. And uh, I thought he'd get mad at me right away. And I, I have so many rib stories with Paul <laughs> chasing me, but uh, from ribs that we've, we've done to each other. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, and in Florida, we catch fiddler for crabs for bait. And uh, they have one small arm and one big arm. And uh, Paul hurt his arm with Hogan. Um, you know how Terry would run in. Uh, he would give you the turnbuckle, shoot you into the turnbuckle, and run in with the clothesline. Yeah. And somehow, I'm sure it was an accident. Uh, Terry never tried to hurt anybody on purpose, obviously. And uh, he uh, uh, hit Paul with a clothesline in the neck, 
And um, I remember on the road after that match, Paul was complaining, oh, my neck, my neck, my neck. And I would say, Paul, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. And he'd put it off, put it off, put it off. And finally, you could see his arm shrinking. And I said, Paul, you need to go get an operation. And, you know, he's making 25 to 35,000 bucks a week. I mean, I saw his checks. And he just thought he was going to lose his spot. And I kept trying to tell him, Paul, you're too talented. There's no Oscar. I called him Oscar. There's no Oscar like you. And um, uh, you're going to have your spot back. Guaranteed. I guarantee you, you'll have your spot back. But he just couldn't take the time off in his mind to go get that operation. So there was, there was, Paul kind of got, that bothered Paul with Terry to answer your question. Now, the UWF, I think it did the second second highest rating of any Dark Side of the Ring this week. So it was a big hit. I have some questions for you related to that. But maybe since you're the expert on it, maybe you could just take us through from start to finish your story of it, um, of what you feel like sharing. And then if you don't answer some of the questions I have for you in it, I'll ask you at the end. Okay, your audience is going to get a real treat because I didn't have time to do this on Dark Side of the Ring um, because there's three people, uh, you know, you have three, four people, four characters and back and forth due to time constraints. But I met Herb Abrams um, um, somewhere on somewhere I was um, on the uh, West Coast. I met Herb and it was after... It was around 1990, and um, he told me he w- was doing the UWF, and he wanted me to be a big part of that. So we talked about money, and the money was right. And um, Herb had owned some uh, clothing companies. He had a big and tall store. He had a woman's uh, uh, store for heavier women. Um with very nice clothing and he was successful in that business and he even had a partner i can't remember his name at one time that helped him with the uwf start the formation of it and uh i went to Reseda, california worked uh, had some you know the even though the place is only held uh, what 400 people they were packed and so the audience was hot it was live uh i decided to um to create uh, a character, a valet for myself, uh, which happened to be my wife, Tony. And um, um, she uh, she uh, became my valet and dressed in, uh, she, we called her Honey. And I used to bale hay with my grandfather, some wonderful stories of my grandfather in Arkansas. And we, he had usually three to 400 head of cattle and we'd round them up on horses, and we had these cattle prongs. And they'd have six double D batteries in them, and they'd shock the pee out of those cattle. And they'd go wherever you want them to go, because you had to get them into a chute to give them shots, warm them, and spray them uh, for flies. And uh, so I had always remembered that cattle prong, and I thought, well, what a great gimmick. So I told you I like visual aids. So this is the uh, original Stinger cattle prong, uh, you can see the, uh, I don't have any battery, batteries in it right now, or you can see the arc uh, light up. You know? <laughs> the battery is going here, and you, it's got a safety on it, just like a gun, because it'll, it'll light you up. So um, I, uh, <laughs> we had a finish, you know, I did it with Spivey and Orton, or something had happened, you know, they'd do something dirty and dastardly to me, and Honey would reach in and sting him, you know, um, maybe I'd make a comeback, boom, all of a sudden they stop me and uh, do something really nasty, um, about to pin me or something, and Honey would reach in and press the button and sting him, and they'd go crazy, and of course there's no batteries in it. So one time I thought she was going to catch me, but I, I snuck the batteries in there, and I put the batteries in there. and So... Uh, working with Bob Orton and I, I didn't know what was going to happen and 
I've never been shocked by one of those and didn't even want to test it, you know. So, I mean, if it moves a bull, it's, it's got to hurt pretty bad. So <laughs> she reaches up and presses that button because I always told her, you make, you, it's a shoot. You know, you're working a shoot. You're always working a shoot. You know, that's what I was always taught. You know, you're working a shoot. I mean, it's got a, if the fans don't believe it, then, you know, you don't have the luxury of, uh, of angles and television cameras. I mean, you got to lay it in. And so I give her the, so she pressed the button. And hold, I said, hold it like you're, you know, shaking it and everything, like it's moving your arm. So I put those batteries in there and all of a sudden the finish comes. I hear her go, oh my gosh, the loudest scream I ever heard. And he goes, gee, and he's going, ah, you know, and that Bob Orton thing, and the way he puts his arms up, ah, and so it was a, it was a shoot, you know, and he's going, God damn, you know, da, 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 da. excuse my friend, so I hate that word, uh, but he was really upset, <laughs> just for a minute, and uh, anyway, uh, finish goes, and she was so upset, oh my gosh, because he was looking at her like she did it, you know, on purpose, um, <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, not long after that, she decided she had enough of the wrestling business. So how did you end up becoming booker of that company? Was that from the start when he recruited you? He wanted your mind to help him develop angles? Yeah, he needed that and some talent and some things like that. And, uh, you know, it just... Uh, didn't want, uh, I mean, I booked in Oklahoma, and, um, you know, did, did uh, a lot of uh, creative things, but um, he, uh, um, he wanted somebody that had talent connections too, and somebody that the guys kind of respected, and so uh, I got a lot of the talent there for him, and he uh, um, was running out of money and started um, bouncing some checks. But prior to that, we he came to Tampa a lot. He loved to come to Tampa because there was lots of hookers and lots of cocaine in Tampa. And that was Herbie's favorite thing. You put him in a pair of cowboy boots and uh, give him some cocaine and a hooker, and he's that's his end-all, do-all. And so he... Uh, uh, we would go to eat at a place called Donatello's. Um, I had a friend named Ed Barbara who was a really good golfer and he um, uh, was also a wrestling fan and enjoyed the, uh, the industry quite a bit. And so he would come to dinners and Ed had a friend named Tom Kenny. Well, Tom Kenny uh, owned a switching company called CMI. And what they did is they bought minutes. He lived in Atlanta and they bought minutes from MCI. Remember the phone company MCI? Yeah. He would package minutes and uh, sell them at a discounted, he'd buy them at a discounted rate and sell them at a, a cheaper rate than AT&T and the other companies. Um, so he was making a ton of money. And his brother was the accountant who was the super fan. Big, I mean, the biggest wrestling fan I've ever seen in my life. And he was the accountant. And so we would have these big dinners in Donatello's. It became like a little hangout for everybody. You know, they'd fly in and um, it was Lear Jets and limousines. And uh, Herbie decided somehow, I guess, um, well, uh, Tom Kenny has a golf tournament. This, how, the reason I got to know Tom better is Ed said um, that uh, there was a golf tournament at Horseshoe Bend Country Club in Atlanta and that um, everybody was going to fly in and play golf for a charity. So I'm not the best golfer in the world, but I can golf. You know, I have wonderful times with a uh, great story with Undertaker and Brian Adams, um, Dan Spivey. We were all golfing buddies, but um, uh, we used to always play bingo, bango, bongo. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but if, all the golfers know what bingo, bango, bongo is. And, um, so we go to this Horseshoe Bend uh, tournament, and we go to the tournament. I cannot yeah. believe it. Ed, Ed's on fire. As a matter of fact, for another visual aid, just so you can verify the story here, here's our trophy. Uh, 
and it says, if you can read it, it says uh, 1991 uh, Horseshoe Bend Country Club. And uh, so we win the tournament. And um, Ed's real excited about that. And Ed's got a ton of money, too. And uh, everybody heard, everybody winds up eating at Donatello's again. And this time, Tom brings his brother from the switching company. And Tom has a wonderful wife, Marsha, and uh, she's still alive. Tom passed, uh, God bless him. But uh, uh, we're all having a good time at uh, Donatello's restaurant in Tampa, one of the best Italian restaurants you'll ever eat at. And inside of uh, the restaurant, we're all at the tables, and I can see Herbie now going to work. And we wind up. Everybody somehow winds up in Atlanta, and he convinced Tom Kenny to, I don't know what the structure of the deal was, but I know that he wound up getting, I think it, he got $3 million in total, a million bucks at a time, and um, Tom didn't know about the last two, only his brother did. Tom was willing to throw a million bucks at it, not really caring whether... Well, I'm sure he cared, but it wasn't like he wasn't going to be able to pay his uh, mortgage payment if he lost a million bucks. So uh, Herb actually um, got to be really tight with the accountant brother. And so that's where the money started coming from to build the UWF, to get Andre, to get all the talent that he got, that he wound up getting. He was uh, John Tolos. What a, what a funny guy John Tolos was. Um you know, again, he's he was uh, you know older, and I'm like a young guy in front with some of the older guys that are there. But uh, there's a lot. He brought in a lot of the WWT. You know, Bam Bam Bigelow um, he brought in uh, Scott. You know, Bigelow, and uh, he brought in a lot of the guys. How much would Andre have been in those days? Just to stop you for a second, just for ballpark for an appearance. Um, I would say he probably paid Andre, um, 10 or 15,000 bucks for the time because he had, Vince had let him go, I guess. And, uh, you know, he came into that, um, and, um, so, um, that's how UWF was funded. And... You know, then, of course, we had the pay-per-views. Um, let me see. You know, we had that. The, the, what is this? The Bash at the Beach or Beach Brawl? Beach Brawl. Beach Brawl. Yeah, we had um, Bash at the Beach. Um, you know, and it got it got to be hot enough where, um, you know, the, the actual magazine started running articles about the UWF and... So it started getting popular. Then uh, Herb always wanted to be the uh, Vince McMahon Jr. You know, he wanted to be the Vince McMahon Jr. And he started the merchandising and uh, he saw the commercials that we did for Vince. And so then he started his own, you know, T-shirts and merchandising and things like that. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, here's one of my all-time favorite early pictures. That's uh, Gordon Soli, uh, Jack Briscoe, and I don't want anybody taking a picture of that, copying it. But it's Gordon Soli, Jack Briscoe, and uh, myself on my couch after I bought the very house that I live in when I was 23 years old. And uh, I think there's a couple beer bottles there, so I'll keep that out of there. <laughs> so, you know, the, we used to have a great time. The guys would come over and um, just have, have a super time, a super, super, super time. But he then, then he, he got Orndorff, he got Mick Foley, he got, um, golly, so much talent. Um, Billy Jack Haynes, I guess. Yeah, Bob Orton Jr., Billy Jack Haynes. He got uh, Bruno San Martino. Then he got... Um, what do you think Bruno would have charged to be under contract? Or would it have, would it have been just appearances? Or would it have been in uh, like a yearly deal? I don't, I don't really know. That was very private. Whatever he paid Bruno, I think uh, only Bruno. Bruno was a very strict business guy. What a, what a great, wonderful man Bruno San Martino was. When you got to know Bruno, if he liked you, uh, he would do anything for you. And he was just 
always a gentleman. And one of, one of my favorite things that anybody ever did for me was to sit down and tell me what I did wrong. Uh, nothing, people that fear criticism will fe be fearful all their life. Because if you don't accept good criticism, you can never improve. And guys like uh, the Briscoes and, and Bruno, and they would always put you over for some reason, but then they would come back and say, man, why don't you try it this way? Or why don't you maybe incorporate this? Or, you know, you, you should uh, have more fire in your comeback. Or whatever their advice was, it was, it was always good advice. And, you know, you always want to listen to advice, whether you're going to use it or not. People, if they want to, if they want to explain something, they feel like they're helping you, go ahead and listen. And if it helps you, it helps you. If it doesn't, be polite and let it go. So I was very fortunate to have a lot of good, good guys around that knew that I liked to hear. And I would even go up and ask some of the older guys, you know, some of my seniors, would you mind, uh, sir, watching my match and, uh, you know, just tell me whatever you think. And I, I would really, really appreciate that. And so I mean, I'd go to an old timer, you know, Bill Watson's territory, like a territory, like uh, Swede Hansen. Um, old timer named Swede Hansen. And even though he didn't wrestle my style and he was different, you know, the older guys, when they were kind of on their way out and they're hanging in, you know, they, they really appreciate that when a, a young kid, uh, which I was at the time, uh, uh, asked them, you know, for some help. And I, I would do that very often. And Bruno was just that, just that kind of guy, you know, like a father figure. <laughs> Funny stories with his son, David, some I can't repeat, but. <laughs> How would Bruno have gotten along with her? Because it seems like if he had any suspicions about those type of extracurricular activities, he wouldn't have been impressed. No, not at all. If Bruno had known Herb's lifestyle, it, which he didn't, Herb was always on his uh, best behavior around Bruno because Bruno didn't play around with drugs or hookers or he didn't want anything to do with that. And, um, you know, I... It, I'm glad I stayed clear of all that. You know, unfortunately, I didn't need to get a hooker. <laughs> um, now, who decided where the events would take place? Because I guess there was one in Dakota, some in California, some in Florida, some in the Carolinas, New York. It seems pretty random. Yeah, there was a lot of guys helping him. Lenny Dues, John uh, Arezzi. Um, a lot of guys were giving Herb advice. And so... Um, I don't know whether it was Lenny getting the towns, um, uh, Lenny Douge, uh, Druge, I always pronounce Lenny's last name wrong, Douge, I believe, um, he was a producer for NBC. I mean, Lenny was a very bright guy. And, um, I think that, uh, Lenny helped Herb get the towns. Okay. Why do you think, like, for instance, the beach bash or beach brawl didn't draw as well as it could have? Was that just local promotion? Because it seems like with that kind of talent and Florida, for instance, was known as a big wrestling territory, you'd think the crowd would have been bigger. Well, I would say that, especially in the wrestling, well, in life, you know, wisdom, um, Wisdom is perhaps the best virtue that you can have, um, but wisdom isn't found among fools. And Herb was foolish in the wrestling business. I, again, I don't like to talk about bad about the deceased, but I would say it to his face. And I did many times, uh, many times, um, because of his ego and um, wanted to get juice on television as a promoter. I said, I. You know, I didn't want anything to do with that. And, uh, but Herb had to do it, you know. And as long as my checks were clearing, you know, I, I didn't care. I, I saw that he was foolish with the wrestling industry. And, uh, you know, again, he, uh, Herb, I said this on Dark Side of the Ring, Herb started at the top, really, and worked himself down rather than a Vince McMahon Jr. that, you know, started somewhere in here or senior and, you know, uh, actually, Vince Jr. catapulted the, you know, from WrestleMania 1, look what he did. So 
he built the really from the not from the ground up but from you know a, a place down here into a billion dollar industry is there any angles that you produced in the days when you were booking for herb that you're proud of Mm, I never really thought about that, Devin, and there's none that uh, really stick out. But, um, you know, there was a couple times where we really uh, hit on all cylinders and um, and things were good. I mean, there were, we had some really, really good house shows, some, some excellent ones. I mean, Mick Foley... He didn't care if there were, he's the same way. He, Mick, Mick Foley didn't care if there was 20 people or uh, 20,000 people. Uh, I don't think we had 20,000 people at the UWF, but uh, uh, he would go work his fanny off all the time. <laughs> I'd always go, Mick, man, you're way up in the stands, you know, up in the stands, and there's it shows the audience, you know, that there's no, no audience there. And so that would bother me. But, you know, Mick marches to his own drummer, and... He didn't care, you know, and he got over by doing that. So, you know, what do I know? Uh, but from a television perspective, you know, when you're looking at the shoot, you really don't want to see empty seats. So when you, even though we had a great, like, ringside crowd, once you go past that, you know, you're seeing an empty building. And you can look at it either way. You know, you can look at, at it mixed way or you can look at it my way. Uh, or the way my psychology which... the company way really because that reflects poorly on the company even if wwe did that we all know the crowds these days if someone went on to the hard camera side they would get in a lot of shit if not be fired exactly exactly but so for that mgm grand do you think that the building probably helped bring that event to the building just to get an event of that magnitude in the building? Um, you know, again, Herb had my, Herb would either be rich or poor. Um, the deals he worked out, I was never part of that. I, I was never a part of, um, uh, you know, putting together the, uh, major events. And it, like I, I told him, I said, don't go to Palmetto, Florida for the pay-per-view. I said, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's a gigantic building, but you know, you just, by then the, the cocaine had got to his brain so much. And it's not just the cocaine. He was drinking, uh, um, uh, scotch. He'd have scotch. He started drinking scotch and cocaine and, and then it got to be where he would take the Xanax or the Valiums or whatever to come down off the cocaine. And it, it, Herb's mood and his everything started changing. You know, if he would have if he would have really listened to bright minds around him, I mean, we just went through the talent he had there. He could have picked every one of the guys um, minds and gotten together and done group booking and really made a success out of um the uwf i think uh, but again he was foolish in that sense what was the first red flag for you because obviously when you first got into this venture with him you didn't realize what you were dealing with from his uh kind of mentally unstable personality um my first red flag was um we were we were in California and we were supposed to be at a, sh uh, he was supposed to, we were supposed to ride together to this show and he, he wasn't there. I kept, you know, we're going to be late to the show. We're going to be late to the show. So I go and knock on his hotel room and he's got freaking hookers and cocaine. And that's the first time I saw him with hookers and cocaine and, um, I said, this is not right, and if he does this, I already know. There's no businessman that's going to survive doing things like this right here. And then some checks, a couple of checks started bouncing. He bounced one to me, and I went off on him for that because I've never bounced a check to anybody. I remember having Gold's Gyms and having to parlay credit cards to pay my people, you know, before I before they became so successful. But, um, you know, Herb, who, I – 
I believe in the analogy or the thought process is, you know, you got to crawl before you walk. You got to cry before you talk. And Herb just wanted to cut a promo um, before he learned to do either while he was running, uh, if you know what I'm saying. Is it true that he could have paid some of the wrestlers when he was out of money with cocaine? Did you ever hear any of those rumors? No, there's a few I could think of that he probably could have done that with, but uh, I never heard that he actually did that. Was there any wrestler when you were booking that territory that uh, ever gave you any problems from a booking standpoint? No. You know, we, we forgot to mention Dr. Death, Steve Williams. He, he was a, you know, um, uh, Brunzel and I became the... Were the UWF World Tag Team Champions. Uh, Dr. Death Steve Williams uh, was the Universal Wrestling Heavyweight Champion. And, uh, you know, he was, Steve got a lot of life back in him with the UWF because, you know, after that stupid stuff with the boxing, uh, uh, Steve just wasn't the same after that for a long time but I, I really saw the life popping back into him and the enthusiasm it's just a shame that uh, you know he got cancer and for Herb's death we heard a couple different versions on the show what do you think is the most plausible version of how he actually passed away I know how he passed away he passed away in the back of a squad car uh, with his shirt unbuttoned his long black socks on, a pair of boxing shorts, covered in Vaseline, cocaine, and had a heart attack. And that's and he was buried after that. The body was put in the ground. It's the strangest thing, Devin, because I didn't hear about the funeral. I didn't hear about anything other than the police report. Bill Anderson, I guess, visited his grave or something that he told me the other day. So there is, I guess, a gravestone for him, at least. Yeah, I saw that on Dark Side of the Ring, you know, where somebody said, uh, and, it was, and it was very touching. Lenny was extremely touching, saying that I know if uh, Herb was alive that he would call me because Herb and Lenny were tighter than peanut butter and jelly. I kept Herb at an arm's length because of his lifestyle and of course like he probably had issues with uh, owing a lot of people money too so he probably really didn't care if he lived or died too much towards the end i don't think he really wanted to die Devin, but um I, herb thought he was invincible you know i tell you what he, herb was the most affable guy that you could imagine you know you just picture a guy about five foot two in a pair of cowboy boots, uh, you know, with a, he's a stereotypical, uh, my mother's Jewish, so I can say this is a Jew, um, with the hair all out and uh, um, sticking straight out. And uh, anyway, uh, um, he, uh, sorry about that, uh, so he, he uh, I just, had to turn that off. Uh, I'm surprised it's not the Killer Bees theme on there. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm sure that her, her uh, is buried right where his cemetery is. Did you ever have any contact with WCW about uh, coming in there after UWF shut down? Absolutely. I was in the back. Uh, I was in the back seat. Uh, Terry was driving his car. Eric Bischoff was in the front seat um linda was in the car terry's wife uh my wife T tony um i was in the middle no tony was in the middle i was on the left side and we had discussed a little bit and it went into the car and eric said okay i'm gonna fly you up and um uh we'll get a contract done and um, I was excited about it. it was the money was right and and that was it I mean I called for him and he never returned my call 
So, because you've been tight with Terry from the beginning, didn't you have uh, Hogan's first match with him? Yes, in uh, Chiefland, Florida. He was a super destroyer. That was another rib. Another, that's another story for another. <laughs> uh, you're going to milk me for everything. Uh, but, uh... <laughs> well, maybe you could tell this story or confirm. I did read it in Hogan's book. Were people saying that Pat Patterson was going to, like, convincing him that part of his initiation was Patterson was going to have his way with Hogan, I guess, sexually in the back, and he was all freaked out that that was going to happen? Um, you know, if that's true, um, you know, I don't, Terry never shared that with me. I mean, um, it was his daughter Brooke's birthday, May 5th, and chatted a little bit. Um, I've always been fond of Terry and we've had a long time. He, him and Mr. Wonderful and my little brother were my best men in my wedding. And, um, that's just enough more ribs that makes me think of more funny stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've always confided in each other and, uh, he's very easy to talk to and he's a great listener. Unlike um, another guy that I really like and a strange character, Jesse Ventura, uh, Jesse and I live in adjoining apartments in the Kansas city territory, probably my worst favorite my least favorite territory of all times because the trips were long and the pay was skinny and got tank Patton. i remember a guy named tank Patton. i remember um uh, buck robley was the booker it's the first time i ever participated uh it was a halloween night in um Tumwa, iowa i believe it was and they had a blindfold battle royal never heard of a blindfold battle royal so um, I mean, the spots, though, were hilarious. You know, you could actually see through the blindfold. So you'd sh shoot somebody into the rope for a backdrop, and you'd bend over, and they'd run past you and fall over the top rope. And, you know, just a lot of comical spots. But um, uh, Jesse was the kind of guy, you got in the car with him, and he would rock back and forth. He always had the dip in his mouth. He'd constantly, he'd never stop rocking, never. I mean, he'd be in his apartment. I've heard that from other people, too. He'd be in his apartment uh, with no shirt on and a pair of boxers and his little dog, Arnold. I can picture it right now. And he'd be rocking. Even if even if the chair didn't rock, he would be rocking. And he'd have that dip in his mouth. And um, But he, he could talk a mile a minute. So you have to be a good listener to, be, to hang around Jesse, which I did quite often. And so Jesse would speak 90% of the time and I would answer the other 10%. Listen then to Jesse, but he's a very interesting uh, person. And apparently, he's talking about it again. He might be running for president under the Green Party. He's going to decide by July. What do you make of that? I don't think he will. No, I just don't. Any uh, any unusual story or any story we may not have heard about Jesse you could share with us? He's pretty popular on this channel. Oh yeah. Um, this is a good, a good story you should ask Jesse about. Um, we were we were the young guys. This, I, I remember I was going to Kansas City for my first territory after leaving Florida. And that's where I met Jesse. And Jesse was still green. He had been in the business a little longer than I had. Um, but we were both still kind of green. And we worked an angle. And because they had always featured the older guys so often... And Jesse could really talk. I mean, Jesse had a great rap right from the beginning. And Kansas City, uh, big Coliseum, uh, hadn't been sold out in well over a year. And it was Harley Race, Bob Geigel, and Pat O'Connor. And all three of them were there. And they were so excited. I mean, there were people that could not get in the building. And Jesse and I were the main event. And... I remember they were laughing and they were talking and everything was really cool. And there was a, there's a big curtain there in the auditorium and I could see him over in the corner just, and I, I was happy, you know, because, you know, this was like my first big time main event. And, um, um, just, yeah, I worked really hard for that to get there, but they would always give us a finish and tell us, you know, what to do. I mean, these guys knew their stuff. Well, 
it, it's time for the main event. It's time for us to go on. And nobody's given us a finish. And I said, Jesse, did you get a finish? No, I didn't either. Jesse said, no, let's rock it with a lip out. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, um, uh, I don't know. What do you want to do? And so we're deciding what to do. And uh, somehow we came up with, okay, um, you know, there's a lot of heat here. They're going to they're gonna go crazy. Uh, so let's try, let's milk them before we even tie up or whatever. And so he said, okay, why don't you chase me around the ring? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get in and I'll beg off, I'll beg off. And uh, let's play it by ear. So, or no, there was there was a uh, there was a drop down spot somewhere. Uh, I think uh, I went to swing at him first. After he begged off, begged off, he nut shot at me, grabbed me, threw me into the rope, um, threw me into the ropes, dropped down. I jumped over him. And when I jumped over him, I wound way up. And when I hit him, it sounded like the roof came off the building because I had already chased him around and chased him around and they still hadn't seen us. So at least we were uh, in our greenness. We were smart enough to know that much. But every time I hit him, the, it was electrifying. The whole crowd went, whoa, whoa. I mean, it was loud, loud and so you know, we both thought it was a great match. And, oh, gosh, I chased him all the He decides to bail. And I decide to chase him. And I caught him and I beat him some more. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And I beat him so much. We get to the back. And there's Pat O'Connor, Harley Race, and Bob Geigel. And they're going, what the hell were you guys doing? I, we were, like, dumbfounded. What do you mean? We just heard all this great noise. And what do you mean? Oh, my gosh. You never stopped him, Jesse. You should have stopped him. You should have beat the piss out of him. And then Geigel goes, did you give him the finish? No. Harley, did you give him? This is uh, Pat O'Connor talking. Did you give him the finish? No, I thought you were getting him the finish. And so nobody gave him gave us the finish. And so now they start this big argument in, in, in between the three of them. And Jesse and I are looking like, oh, my gosh. You know, th these guys are getting ready to shoot on each other. And uh, so we, we went went back to our locker rooms and each one of them, I don't know what they said to Jesse, but they came to me and said, you know, I guess we dropped the ball, blah, 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 you know, and it was a shame because, you know, we satisfied the people. We didn't give them something. He should have beat me somehow or slipped down a banana peel or um, he, he could have just, he could have done something to completely stop me and haul ass after I hit him just a few times and then we could have come back in a lumberjack match. Yeah. So he could have, it could have escaped. And maybe the lumberjack could turn on us and then we could come back in a cage match. And so we could, you know what I'm saying? I'm thinking Booker now. Yeah. So, so anyway. The heat was wasted. Yes. And you just mentioned Harley. I got to ask you about Harley because, of course, we lost him over the past year uh, since the last Cauliflower Alley reunion. I was a huge fan of his and always loved him, attended a couple of his camps. Great guy. Um, Harley was a fabulous guy. And I remember, I remember vividly when I came into the Kansas City Territory, Harley was kind of took me under his wing and we were in his Porsche this white Porsche and we're driving and he scared me so bad because he would go so fast. And I don't know whether he was ribbing me or I've heard a lot of stories. That's just how he drove. And I mean, fast on like two lane roads and we were going down this two lane highway and all of a sudden the window rolls down. He reaches underneath the seat and he pulls out this big, dirty, hairy 357 Magnum and starts going, blam, and my eardrums are about to break. Blam, blam, blam. And there, I see a jackrabbit. You know, as I'm turning, he was trying to shoot a rabbit at 100 miles an hour. And uh, he was just crazy like that. I, I, oh, I, and one thing that was absolutely hilarious in Shreveport, Louisiana, there was this... Uh, uh, there, there was this dancer, 
And um, I was never into strip clubs or anything like that. But uh, there was one little club that the guys would go to in Bossier City once in a while. And there was a couple dancers there. And I guess Harley kind of liked liked the girl. And um, he, he kept buying her drinks and was buying her drinks. And he found out that she was drinking just ginger ale, that there was no alcohol in there. And he figured he's going to get a little loopy, whatever. And uh, so um, all the guys are talking, things are just happening. Harley's down there and uh, towards the front. And um, we, we see this girl bend over. We, I, all of a sudden, I, I looked over and I see this girl bend over and all of a sudden, <laughs> I mean, when she bent over, she was, it was like holding her stomach, and I'm trying to put this in the kindest way. <clears throat> you know, she got diarrhea, and it like flew out of there uh, between her g-string. You know, they were totally naked, and uh, Harley had put uh, a whole bunch of Visine in that drink, uh, and apparently, Visine gives you diarrhea, and. You know, I wish Harley was here to tell the story, but uh, he he uh, gimmicked her drink for her, not for him gimmicking him, you know, tell, or telling him that he was buying her drinks and she was making him a drink more. And here she didn't even have alcohol in her drink, so he got her back good. That's hilarious. And another guy really popular on this channel, he was in UWF. We talked about him before with uh, with Rip, but do you have any personal stories about Billy Jack Haynes. I know he worked the Florida territory. He was in WWE with you. Yeah, no, I mean, Billy was, um, uh, always, we, Billy and I always got along. Um, I know that he was, uh, very intimidating to a lot of people and, um, and Billy was always jacked up, you know, on, uh, you know, a lot of the guys were jacked up on the roids. Um, but um, he uh, he was just a, a very uh, he could get really mad. I remember a lot of arguments he would get into with different people, just yelling back and forth and just stuff I don't like to be around, you know. And uh, I never really saw him beat anybody up or anybody beat him up. But I, I saw several times when it looked like somebody was going to hit somebody. And is it true that there was a title switch once with the Killer Bees at a house show or something that was never acknowledged on TV? Yes, I believe it was in Rochester, then Binghamton. Um, and um, it was just, uh, wasn't a big, you know, it was, we had been promised the belts three times. It was just an appeasure type thing. And we had been promised the belts three times and by Vince and George Scott. And that's why I wound up giving my notice in Salisbury, Maryland. I asked Vince if I could speak with him. And of course, he's always a gentleman to me. And I'll never forget that. Vince Jr. was always a gentleman and always has been a gentleman to me. You know, you hear a lot of bad stories about Vince Jr., but he's always been wonderful. And I uh, said, Vince, um, you know, uh, I just, uh, I'm beat up. I'm tired. I just want to give my my two weeks notice. This was right before WrestleMania 5, uh, a little bit before WrestleMania 5 in uh, 1989, I believe it was. And I had, I had uh, really developed a great friend in Pete Grimkowski who owned uh, 52% of Gold's Gym Corporate. And I said, uh, you know, I want to just uh, uh, go try my hand in business of some kind. And um, he was very understanding. He said, okay, I want you to come back. Uh, well, I want you to be successful in your business, but I want you to know the door's open. Um, come back, we'll do something different. Uh, you know, maybe work for the Intercontinental title or something like that. I mean, he was so businesslike and so thoughtful. And, uh, uh, you know, even paid me for WrestleMania 5. So, uh, that was uh, uh, that was uh, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I see, and I guess you never went back because your businesses were a success. Oh, exactly. Yes, um, 
more successful than I ever dreamed possible. Is it true Gould's has gone out of business? I just filed for Chapter 11. Is that the whole uh, franchise? That's corporate. So in Gold's Gym, you're a licensee. So when you're a licensee, the difference between a franchise and a licensee, let's say you, if you go to a McDonald's in Tampa, Tupelo, Mississippi, or anywhere in Tennessee, a Big Mac's a Big Mac. You see the Golden Arches. It's all the same. Pricing's pretty uniform. Uh, it's a lot more expensive in Japan or at the airport. But uh, overall, the food's the same. A licensee, they give you minimum standards. And then after the minimum standards, uh, like you have to buy a quarter of a million dollars worth of equipment, your licensee fee is $10,000 a year. You have to, um, anything that says Gold's Gym on it, you have to buy from Gold's Gym. And, but they don't give you instructions how to run a gym. At least they didn't then. There was no instructions whatsoever. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of trial and error. And I remember parlaying credit cards to make payroll. And in the end, I wound, we wound up having, um, you know, like 110 employees, 120 employees, uh, not counting, not counting our individual contractors, which were our aerobics instructors, because our accountant said, if you tell somebody that they have to work for you, then you have to deduct payroll. And so I couldn't afford to do that at the time. And so I just paid one instructor to coordinate all the aerobics instructors. That's why I often wonder how people in the wrestling industry, whether it's AEW, NWA, whoever, get away with, you know, paying somebody as an individual contractor when you can't just go work for whoever you want to. That's true. And for this coming up, Cauliflower Alley Club, just to give a little preview, do uh, you want to talk about some of the honorees this year? Oh, we have some tremendous honorees from uh, Medusa. Uh, it's going to be the Iron Mike honoree. Uh, the Road Warriors were coming up on the dark side of the ring. Um, uh, Paul Ellering will be there along with Joe the Animal, and I only wish Hawk could be there, but uh, he'll be there in spirit and on film, um, on tape. And uh, so the Road Warriors will win the tag team. Um, uh, Ray Mysterio Jr., um, is going to win the Lucha Librador, <coughs> Lucha Libro Award, excuse me. Uh, it's, it's a plethora. All you have to do is go to caulifloweralleyclub.org. You can see everything. And again, you can join for 25 bucks for a year. Uh, you have to be a member to come uh, to our reunions, and you have to be a nice person. We have thrown some people out um, for not being a nice person because we're, we're like family, you know, and the Cauliflower Alley Club, you know, there's a lot of hearts, but we all beat as one. And uh, it's all for the same cause. You know, our mission is to help people from the wrestling industry that have fallen on difficult financial times. And we give them a hand up, and uh, it's a tremendous feeling no dollars are wasted as i mentioned before and if just go to caulifloweralleyclub.org uh join come to our reunion september we actually have discounted rooms from september uh 20th through the 24th so we get incredibly cheap hotel rooms like 49 bucks and um plus taxes and uh um um the reunion is 125 dollars for You've got all kind of seminars, as you know, Devin. Um, there's so many things happening from the strut contest uh, to uh, these are things that free wrestling matches that Billy Blade puts on. Um, there's there's just action, things happening all the time. It's like the biggest party, uh, wrestling party of the year. So be sure to go to caulifloweralley.org and uh, whether you can make it to the reunion, we'd love to see you as a wrestling fan. Um, um, Again, everybody's nice, and if you can't make it, join anyway. Because uh, out of your twelve, out of your twenty-five dollars, if you join for a year, or out of your three hundred dollars, if you join for a lifetime membership, you know half of that money goes to help the wrestlers, and the other half goes to send you your ears, your newsletters. It's called the Ear, which is award-winning, four-color, uh, beautiful production. Now, the tag team award last year went to Haku and Barbarian. Uh, so you mentioning that reminded me to ask you if you had any Haku stories. I know you're very close with him. Yeah, I am. Haku's probably the most humble guy in the world. Um, 
I got to get going pretty quick though. Um, yeah. uh, Haku is a, a wonderful guy. I mean, you know, just the same stories everybody's heard. You know, I've seen Haku clean the bar out. You know, he just, I tell you, if I could book what I think would have been the greatest fight during their primes, and I would never, and they wouldn't fight each other out of respect, but it would have been Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff against Haku. I think that would be the most even, best fight you could ever watch. I'll remind you that if you ever remember John Matuzak, Google him, played for the University of Tampa, then the Oakland Raiders. Paul Orndorff knocked him out on the basket. Freddie Solomon, the quarterback and former San Francisco 49er, uh, God love him. Uh, I was looking for Freddie, right? But I've got a real nice thing of Freddie, uh, who was a great friend. Uh, he uh, uh, was a tremendous athlete, tremendous athlete, and a devout uh, Christian, good, wonderful um, a mentor of youth, just did everything for the community. He would never lie. Here's his funeral card right here. Um, Freddie told me that Sammy Gellerstead, the little nose guard, uh, who I watched go through the center's legs and blocked the winning attempted field goal for the National Division II Championship, went through the center's leg and blocked the 20-yard field goal attempt for the win. That's what a good little athlete this guy was. And they were playing pickup basketball. Uh, uh, Matuzak, uh, little Sammy Gellerstead got the ball from Matuzak. Somebody, uh, Ron Mikulojak, the offensive lineman, Ron Mikulojak, started in on uh, on uh, Matuzak about letting uh, Gellerstead out-rebound him. And at the opposite end of the court, the next time Gellerstead came down, I mean, uh, Matuzak elbowed him and broke, uh, elbowed little <coughs> Sammy Gellerstead's nose. And Paul and Sammy were very tight. Um, Freddie Solomon told me that Paul hit him with a left hook out of nowhere. And uh, Matuzak hit that uh, solid concrete basketball thing and laid there for two minutes without moving one punch i saw paul knock out so many people i mean i'm not going to go into any of the other wrestling stories but uh paul was a very 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 tough guy you'll have to do a whole book on the paul orndorff fights when you get them with yours oh god i remember some oh oh the stop sign one time was snowing <laughs> Some guy was riding our tail, and I, I, you know, I'm from Florida. I'm not used to driving in this ice, and uh, so I wasn't driving so fast. It was night, and the snow's coming down, and this guy kept trying to push me, and he was literally almost pushing us. And Paul was really getting pissed off, and I, I was getting upset too. And so there's this, there's this four-way stoplight, and so I had to stop. And I'm thinking, oh God, this guy's gonna come out and hit us with a baseball bat or something, and stupid idiot I, I opened my door just a latch you know just where i had my door open where it wasn't all the way shut and as he's approaching me I, I rolled my window down and he's lighting into me cussing 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 and as he does i go wham i pull my car door out and i hit him and of course it's slippery out there he falls right on his ass and i jump out and i kicked him right in the face and that, that's all that needed to be done i said let's go paul Paul picked him up and threw him into the car. And I mean, there was, I don't know what happened to this guy. I don't know if he lived or died. <laughs> it's just, we left him in the snow. His car was running, his headlights were on, and Paul just left him in the snow. Uh, not bloody as a pulp. I felt really bad about that. Those so. stories don't happen anymore. That's hilarious. And yeah. uh, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you very much. You want to let us know where the fans can follow you on, on Twitter and Facebook and the Cauliflower Alley uh, social media? Sure, absolutely. Uh, if you want any photos, merchandise, or anything, go to the killerbees.net. Uh, you want to follow the Cauliflower Alley Club, go to caulifloweralleyclub.org. Uh, I'm on Facebook, both the Killer Bees, B. Brian Blair, 
Brian Blair in Tampa. Twitter is Killer B One B. That's Killer B the number one B. And uh, I'd be happy if you uh, gave me a follow. And I appreciate the time, Devin, and I appreciate your audience. I know you got a wonderful audience. Uh, how many people, by the way, are you up to? That are uh, we have over a hundred and ten million views and hundred and eighty thousand subscribers. That is absolutely fabulous. Um, my hat's off to you, Devin. You've really done a great job uh, building your business. And I uh, love your father-in-law. Please tell him I said hello. And I can't wait to see you at the Cauliflower Alley Club. And well, we I pray that they open the borders in time for me to, to be able to cross in September. But it seems like things are improving. Yeah, I think they are, and people are getting restless. So, And for all the people out there that are you know, homebound, you know, stay positive. Positive. It's not going to stay like this. And we all need to realize we need to get back to work as a society. And if you look at the real numbers, the people that are really dying are not people with great immune systems. It's people with suppressed immune systems, the elderly, those that are already weak. So I think this will soon pass. And um, as soon as they, uh, Redesivir or hydrochloroquine or whatever, uh, once they come out with a firm uh, cure, that they're going to prescribe on a steady basis, which is right here, any week, any day now. And uh, then uh, things are going to loosen up. And so hopefully the fears will go down and uh, we'll go back to a normal society. And to shut this down, the last thing, could you give us a little promo on the Iron Sheik? The Iron Sheik, wow, I'd say, uh, well, you know, he's crippled now, so what am I going to say to the Iron Sheik? I don't know, I'd say something, well, if he was back in his heyday, I'd say, oh, yeah, let me tell you something, Iron Sheik, with those goofy-looking shoes and that goofy-looking face and that goofy-looking mustache, I got a little riddle for you. What do you do with a guy that's just a little too fat? And that is, you put them on a diet, and I got a diet of nothing but knuckles and punches for you, my friend, because I'm going to put you back on a plane and send you back to Iran with all the rest of the commie folks that you like to hang out with. And don't you ever say 444 days again, or I'm going to give you 444 lashes right in front of my friends. I don't know. Let's just... Good, I'll cut it at that. I'll stop.